everyone. This is Rodul Live. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to talk about my pet subject, Kenyan football. Oh my goodness. But no, for once it's in a positive light. At least that is what I think so. So joining me today is, uh, first of all, a man who knows no, no, needs no introduction, Jaco Buda, the CEO of the Kenya Premier League and commercial director, Taibu Atieno. First of all, Karibu guys. Let me start with you, Jack. Where have you been? <laughs> Can I start like that? And now, I've been around about uh, busy working on uh, uh, the next steps of Kenyan football. And uh, happily, last November, we managed to appoint uh, Taiwan as the commercial director. So, we've been working for the last seven months on uh, the uh, way forward for Kenyan football. Taiwo, before I get into your role as commercial director, in about 30 seconds, just tell us about your football, your career in football, so people know you've actually played the game. Yeah, I'm a former professional footballer, um, born in England, obviously represented Kenya's national team for a period between 2009 and 2014. Um, but since um, I retired from football, um, I've been mostly in business management, law, accounting, um, and obviously using those experiences to try and bring um, much needed investment and organization into the Kenya Premier League. Since, uh, Jack, let me come back to you. Since the Kenya Premier League's contract was not extended by the Football Kenya Federation, I believe it was in September last year, um, what made you think of taking the direction you have taken? Um, that's I just correct it. September 2020. It was September 20. You know, we've lost a year with COVID. I know. So I don't even know what year we're in. The COVID pandemic really messed a lot of things in terms yeah. of uh, the world economy, sports, and all. Um, basically, uh, when we had a discussion previously, and me and Ty have been going back way from 2009, just chatting back and forth um, uh, with the help of, of our chairman, Andrew Sachier. So we realized there's a vacuum in terms of uh, youth football. And we sat down and thought that we need to get our, food, uh, our youth playing football for a week in, week out. And that's why we got the main focus on focusing on the youth as opposed to uh, we saw that uh, the professional game had a lot of quality. So uh, we, we started from the grassroots, but we give it as a better impetus in bringing back uh, corporates and investment into the game. Yeah. Because when, when there used to be the Kenyan Premier League as a league, there was some corporate investment. There was a belief and uh, trust that people could give Kenyan Premier League money. And we've seen what has happened in the last two years. They've not managed to even keep sponsors for, for a full season. Um, so I see why you would take that direction. Um, Taiwo, let me come to you because I know you have done the nitty-gritty behind the current strategic plan. Tell us about the KPL, the current strategic plan. So we, as Jack said, we sat down and we looked at, well, we've sat down and looked at football in Kenya for the past 12 years. I mean, I've known Jack in much years since 2009. So it wasn't, it, it didn't require much um, work for us to pick out the main points that we need to improve on. Um, the strategic plan has four objectives. Um, Number one is to get um, the Kenya Premier League operating competitively within schools so we can get more primary and secondary school um, children playing football. Um, and I think having the brand of the Kenya Premier League associated with that, um, that league will get more schools, um, I think, into, um, uh, into an organisation in which they can have kids aspiring to become professionals. And it gives them a sense of identity that they are part of their national recognised top tier league. Um, and I know as a young boy, if I was playing in a um, in a primary school and it was associated to, with the Premier League in England, then I would be, you know, excited and emphatic with you know, all kinds of joy. So we want to get young kids playing and and in this country, get them playing the same kind of football philosophy. Um, objective number two is to. Um, uh, established at the Kenya Premier League Football Business Academy because as we've seen over the past I'd say even from when I was playing for the national team, we need more people with football business um, knowledge and skills in the administration side of it. Um, and it's not just about FKF and Kenya Premier League it's all across, you know, from the grassroots up, we want 
the county federations, we want the academies, we want the smaller clubs to have people who understand finance, understand company law, understand how to organise their operations in you know, a fashionable, law-abiding football environment. So, you know, we can get more young people in this country playing um, in an organised um, way. Um, objective number three is to get our clubs, um, to guide our clubs, in Premier League clubs, um, on how to incorporate as limited companies. Because right now we've got, I think we've set out this big plan, nearly 70%. 70% of our clubs are operating as partnerships, um, which means that they're not able to attract investors, Investors meaning from private um, institutions um, or individuals who can put capital in the clubs and have a share, which gives them the right to vote and the right to dividends. Um, and I think as we've seen in the pandemic, La Liga, um, Barcelona and a few other clubs have um, revisited their structures because obviously COVID restrictions have prevented them from bringing fans into their stadiums. Um, whereas in England, clubs were already limited companies and therefore were able to raise um, capital on the markets and keep afloat. So we need to look at the best business structure for football here. Um, if we are going to be sustainable in the short, medium, long term, especially if we get another pandemic or another war in Ukraine or something like that. So, um, yeah, we're going to work with the clubs to get that. Objective number four is to implement uh, a multi-sports division. So we get more young kids playing different sports at a younger age, but within the same club. And an example is in Spain again, where Barcelona, our football club, basketball team, they've got volleyball, futsal. And I think what that does is it gives fans a one-stop shop. So they're not supporting lots of these different clubs and the organization is then a promotional um, kind of force in relation to sports in general. Um, and Gorma here, if we had Gorma here football club, Gorma here basketball team, Gorma here futsal, I think it would be good for Gorma here fans because then they can support those teams and those teams are more sustainable because, as we know, basketball and futsal isn't going to attract necessarily the same kind of fan base as football. This is ambitious. It's doable. It's very doable. <laughs> <laughs> I spend a lot of time, every time I travel anywhere, I look for a local team, I sit, I talk to the officials, and they have no clue how to bring a club. They wake up one day and they say, I want to get boys off the street, and I form this club. Now give me kit, give me balls, give me allowances, give me, you know, and they have no resources and no plan. So how are we going to do Private this? Private capital, I think it's a simple as well. The F football clubs and professional football, if you mm -hmm. go to any successful league as well, they have a group of investors, and I don't want to use the word corporate investors because they're mostly considered sponsors here. We are not looking at a sponsored business model. We're looking at an invested business model. And, and again, sounds really good on paper, but you almost need to change the attitude and perception of people who actually love this sport for them to give their money. Yeah, I can give you an example. If you find a company like Casey, they all have uh, there's four or five disciplines that are supporting. But uh, uh, KCB is there as a bank, and then the football club is there being supported by the bank. If uh, all the sporting disciplines would set up a private company, KCB investing, where would they understand that return on investment uh, from, uh, from all the sports? Tasks are the same. But how, how are you going to convince people? To, you see, KCB, and most of our companies, KCB, they're all CSR projects. So yes. they, it's, it's it's the banks trying to show, it's the corporates <coughs> trying to show that we do do some charity. And KCB is a good example. They have rugby, they have volleyball, there's so many sports under the KCB umbrella. But you take it away from KCB, who's going to put their money behind that? They can put their money behind that, but under a different structure in terms of sports within uh, KCB itself. So that... Uh, the, uh, that company is also profitable itself. It won't depend fully on the sponsorship money they're getting from KCB. Mm -hmm. it's, it's changing the structure of, uh, of the, the sporting disciplines into a separate entity from the main company. Because they have, they definitely they have the will to support all the sports and, and make it more profitable. I'd also add as, as well, um, football is a global sport. Mm -hmm. It's not centralized here in Kenya. So when you're asking the question, it's a good question, who in Kenya is going to invest? 
I would probably say 25% of our investment, we will try and get from Kenya. 75% will come from bigger sporting markets. So Man United is not owned by English people. Yeah. Chelsea, uh, Liverpool. <laughs> most, <laughs> most football clubs yeah. that are doing very well in England are owned by Americans. And there's a few owned by Italians and Chinese. So you've got to look at sports globally. And what I'd encourage everyone here in Kenya to look at football is that it doesn't belong to one man or one organisation. Yes, the authority to mandate the rules and the information of football comes from FIFA and um, FKF. But everybody's entitled to set up their own football league here in Kenya. And what we are um, doing at this moment in time is phase one of our restructuring is getting our organisation together. So we've got appointments that we'll announce in the coming weeks and months, but our organisation will be um, a board of members who are at the top tier of professional football, meaning they've been at the top organisations in the world. And for me, that's where it really starts, because we set out our, our, our organisation as being the best in Africa. That's our aim. And so we will establish ourselves as a top tier league based on our ability to actually um, administer and promote the top tier league. That's all it is. So for me, I'm not concerned about who in Kenya will buy into it because at the end of the day, we have to be the leaders and we have to show how a top tier league must be run. So the strategic plan is a strategic report um, and the business plan is something else. And we have the people in order to create a business plan and actually implement it. So that's a top tier league. I guess it's, it's change, you have to change a lot of perception because unfortunately the perception, and I think both internally and outside of the country, is that Kenyan football leaders are corrupt. And I know I've been for meetings with you, Jack, where you've tried to tell people the difference between FKF and KPM. It was so, it's like you're banging your head on a brick wall. They're like, ah, you're Kenyan football, you know. And unfortunately it's a perception with all that's happening in the headlines um, with FKF and being banned and all that, that Kenyan football leaders are corrupt. So I guess you will probably use your own networks to reach out to those out of this country um, to tell them that there's a different sheriff in town running a different program. You know, because that's what you have to do. You'll find corruption in most football. Mm. I mean, FIFA obviously got but how's this indicted by the FBI. <laughs> um, no, but I think Kenya should... I think... Okay, look, yes, football in Kenya has not been working, and I think that is a frustration that I share in, uh, with many people. But what I would say is that what we need are football people, not just former footballers. I don't think any of the best um, organisations are necessarily run just by footballers. But we've got big companies here, listed on Stock Exchange, um, in lots of different industries, we've got hotels, we've got shopping malls. We need business, football-minded people, yeah, to be involved in... The, in, in the construction, the organisation of these football um, organisations. And it doesn't matter if it's coming from FKF or KPR. In fact, it must be, um, we as a league must be leading our clubs. And, you know, the strategic plan is just one um, example of that. But we will be putting together a policy, regulation, um, so that our clubs can fit and see a criteria that they must meet. I and mean, then we'll do it in phases. We're not saying, oh, you can't meet it tomorrow, then you're out. We, we, we understand that this is a long-term project. And for me, as a Kenyan international, I want to make sure that what we do has a short, medium, long-term benefit to all the clubs that we work with. And, you know, grassroots football is the beginning of that. How are you, what's, what's your relationship with the Federation or with the sports ministry? As in, who, do you need, and who has given you, or do you even need a mandate to do what you do to approach these clubs. And when you say our clubs, how does that relationship work? Um, I think KPL was registered in 2003 and uh, last year was 19 years down, down the road. Mm. And uh, the clubs are the ones that set up the KPL. So we just want to bring them back into their fold and then show them the, the, the direction we want to take as a, as a whole company and have it all inclusive. Nobody has an abundance of football knowledge, but if we are working together, definitely we're going to go places. Well, well, I guess the question I'm asking is because depending who comes in to FKF, <laughs> and, if it's, and if any of our past FKF presidents are anything to go by, they will say clubs must not be registered with another body. You are under the Football Federation. So 
There's no conflict there? I think YKP was set up so that the clubs would come in together and commercialize uh, their business. And uh, that's the avenue that they've been using uh, ever since until uh, the money of KPL um, uh, came to an end. So now we want to bring them back and for them to realize that same money that they gave to the company so that they can get the broadcast right and get the title sponsorship and then uh, uh, so forth and so forth. Will they actually be running, will you actually be running a league? We are not there yet. We just want to bring uh, the like minded people together and then put to, uh, to professionalize the clubs yes. first and foremost. And, and just to add on what um, Jack's saying, the, the Kenya Premier League is a limited company. Um, it's not the it's not the member of FIFA that implements the rules. So the federation is there to make sure the rules of, of football are being implemented and abided by. They're not there to say you shouldn't be um, football organisation and you should be. What we're saying is that the Kenya Premier League incorporated by the clubs, similar to the England, um, the Premier League in England, it was incorporated by the clubs to administer their broadcasting and sponsorship rights and provide a centralised um, organisation which has no conflict of interest, meaning the clubs can't do it themselves mm -hmm. because they all have their own interests. That Premier League company in the UK um, administers the rights on behalf of the clubs as a whole. So we have the same structure here, which is, the, is you know, I'm pleased that we already have that structure in place. Um, it's just about making sure that those who are in that structure can lead the clubs as members of the, um, the Kenya Premier League. Um, and then we, we obviously have to work with um, the federation, the member, which will be recognised by FIFA, um, by, you know, it, we have to consolidate our interests because their interest is the national game, our interest is the professional game. Um, and they do coincide, um, because if they don't have good young players coming through these clubs, they won't have a good national team. Yeah, cool. And therefore, you know... So, so in a nutshell, Jack, you're going to try and get your contract back, the one you had with FKS, as our dear friend Nick said, Stacky. <laughs> Uh, we, we don't want to go much on the history, but uh, we are looking at uh, the opportunity that we are losing as a footballing nation. So there's much more that we can gain when we work together and with all the bodies that support the game, mm -hmm. uh, government in terms of infrastructure, getting clubs, investments, uh, training facilities as well. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process that we're now starting off. And uh, I'm happy to mention that uh, this year we should be meeting some club CEOs to pick up their brains and uh, know what the next steps would be. You mentioned, I think, in your first point about schools. Are you working in conjunction with the Ministry of Education? How are you getting to tap into this, into the school system? So I think what my strategy in relation to that um, objective is to speak with some of the private schools, speak with some of the public schools, um, and see whether they're... Um, values and, and I think principles align with what we're trying to achieve. And I think they will. Um, in relation to the ministries, of course, we have to um, meet with the education ministry, the health, and I think we also need to speak with the sports, just to get them on board this plan. Because essentially, everybody in Kenya has an interest in seeing young people develop the right way. Um, and I think, you know, if you think about a young person's um, journey from let's say primary school up to a professional or yeah, professional career, whether that's football or not, um, they go through lots of different um, developmental stages, which is characteristic, personality, communication, you know, the, the things that build character. Um, and, and those things, if you look at um, the structures in England and America, they've implemented sports from a very early age to build the type of communication skills, the confidence, the competences, um, in young people through sports. Um, and one of the things I've identified having you know, travelled much of Kenya in the last 12 years is that we don't have necessarily competitive sports programmes in our primary schools. And if you think uh, football is a skill and if we are looking at the professional side of it, if a young boy or girl is playing um, football, let's say from the age of seven, and then by the time they're 13, if it's three hours a week and 52 weeks in a year, um, they've roughly maybe amassed over a thousand hours. Yeah, that means their skill level of football is here. Now, in Kenya, 
if we're taking our primary schools and saying no sports until your secondary, then they've missed maybe four years. And so their skill, their skill level will, will be down here, yeah. so we have to catch yeah. up here. Yeah. So I think we, we have to look at um, football as a serious um, sport, but also as a, as a way in which to develop young people. Um, because at the end of the day, um, these young people are missing out on an experience that can give them, you know, the knowledge and experience to not just be professional footballers, but to be administrators, to be lawyers, to be whatever it is in the sport, sport industry. And we need, we need those young people, you know, to have that experience. So I think that's what we would try and, you know, collaborate with the, the government and the relevant agencies in order to make sure, you know, we can find a, a comfortable middle ground. All right, I, w I want us to take a, a short break. I still want to come back and talk a bit more about Kenyan football uh, and where the women come in as well and whether they're also being involved. So let's take a short break. Guys, I'll see you in uh, just a bit uh, with the team from Kenya. Kenya. Radul live. I'm with the team from the Kenya Premier League, the CEO, Jacob Guda, and the commercial director, Taiwu Atieno, who've been talking about their ambitious plans. And when I say ambition, don't take it the wrong way. It is ambitious, but I don't think it's not doable. I think it's very, very doable. And uh, Taiwu, during the break, we were talking about all this investment and how... For me, the question is how we take this investment in terms of building flats, which every Kenyan tends to do until we're so saturated in terms of flats, especially in this key money area, um, and how you put that money into sports. How are we going to convince those people to do that? It's real estate, and most real estate is actually uh, financed by banks. So if you're talking about, let's say, a hotel, which can, be, um, can also be a football stadium, so you can have a football stadium which has a hotel, has business um, facilities like conference and banqueting, uh, hospitality as well. Um, that all gets kind of financed by um, corporation which has a bank in which to um, mortgage that construction. And it gets built in phases. So you don't need um, a 50,000 seat stadium and $50 million, you can actually build an 8,000 to 15,000 or maybe 20,000 seat stadium maximum. And it could be between eight, a million, 8 million to $15 million. And it gets built in phases. So at each phase, the stadium is being built and then refinanced, maybe 75% of the loan's value at that point. So it's actually a profit, profitable um, um, real estate exercise. So I think this idea that we need hundreds of millions of dollars and we need you know State every, every, State every, <laughs> every every um stadium in kenya to be built by government i think is unrealistic i think private sector has to come in and it has to be a business model and a business plan to make the stadium profitable and it has to be a brand and it has to be a team in which people um support within their communities and that's why i've always been a, a big um you know fan of having some of our clubs outside of Nairobi in counties and the clubs be named after the, the town, the city or the county itself, so that it represents the people of that particular county. And then it will have more support from those people. Even if they're living in Nairobi, most people on a weekend travel to their home counties on weekends. So I think it can create more domestic tourism and more opportunities for young people to develop and more opportunities for young people to get more jobs. And experience. So I think it's not, I am very ambitious in nature, 
trying to be a professional footballer as a kid. I think I had lots of people tell me that was impossible. But building football facilities and football clubs, Kenyans should not see that as something out of the reach of this country. This country is a very big player in the world um, and it's also um, leading in lots of different um, sectors. So we should be saying, let's get together, let's get organised and we can actually achieve this. And I think it's doable. I think you just need one person to buy in or one corporate or one moneyed person to buy in to see how it's going to work. Because I think that is, it's easy for people to get loans to build flats because you take that business plan and the bank understands it. So they're like, you'll send each for this amount and you'll collect this much rent. So they see that as black and white. In terms of uh, getting returns or getting your money back from a football facility, I mean, it's, it's good you say mix it up with a mall and a hotel and all that stuff. But I think that is what you have to convince a lot of people, at least in Kenya, with money. But I, I'm actually seeing one person do it and then everybody catches on. Yeah. We're in a country of one person starts quail farming and everyone starts quail farming. <laughs> <laughs> so they just have to see that it works. Right. Um, do you have any interest yet? Do you have any solid it. interest? Well, we're putting together business plans. Yeah, but so, for example, I, I have interest in having my own football club in Kenya. You know, I, uh, do you have you know, money? This is what the business plan is. Look, no one, no individual, if you look at any football club in England, no yeah. individual owns a football club. Yeah. It's all through corporations. Man United was basically bought with a loan. And then Man United was refinanced to pay that loan. So the people who bought Man United didn't even have the money to buy Man United. And then that's why they want the clearances out. I would encourage people to look at football clubs as a business in which, like land, you obviously have to acquire the land. The land is obviously insignificant in value compared to when you have to invest in the construction or what you put in there. So if you're going to build a house on a piece of land, do you need all the money to build that? No, you don't. You go to the bank and the bank takes on the risk. And that's where the bank has its charge on the land in which it obviously has mortgage. So we need to look at football practically as a business. I think there's this sometimes this unrealistic approach to it and that's what creates the expectations and the perceptions that I think are failing us they're not they're not succeeding us so for me I look at football as a practical business we need to have um, an income statement we need to have um, a cash flow forecast profit and loss valuation we put all of that into a into an excel document and we see this is the business of football of this football club and everybody knows you know it's not just about selling football players it's about having hospitality. Fans want to come into their club shops, merchandise. They also want to have advertising in that stadium. Other brands want to be in there, so the fans obviously are seen. You've got TV broadcasting. You've got um, online sales from your branding. So football is a multifaceted business. And to look at it just like, do we have the money to build the stadium? I think that's that will tell you that those people aren't necessarily in the business of football. Um, I mean, I mean, there have been lots of initiatives you've tried, including fan movements and things like that, to try and get people interested because um, you, you're absolutely right. You can't have tunnel vision in football. Football should be an experience, not a 90-minute game. And I keep telling people about the, my experience. At, I think it was in Bremen. We went with the Super Sport. And the amount of people who are employed around one Bundesliga game People need to understand you can have lawyers and doctors and groundmen and security and, and hospitality and I guess it's just getting people to understand that. It's kind of what you do with those uh, marshals are volunteers. Somebody is a professional in his own field but he volunteers to go and support. Uh, his yeah. Team. And I remember that trip, I don't know if you were on that trip to Malaga when I went to KPL and, uh, no. uh, and we, we stayed in a golf resort. It was a golf resort but with a football fields and fields for, for, for the KPL select team to train before playing the, uh, the games they were going to play. And I guess that's the concept you have in your mind, that then the hotel is working Monday to Monday, weekends, you're doing the sport, teams are training there. Um, and then if you think about it like this, Kenya, we have lots of hotels, yeah? Yeah. That have cost 50 to 100 millions of dollars, yeah? But have some So plans. people already have confidence in investing in hotel and the business hospitality. Now, as a football club, let's imagine if I'm a football club, I say to the hotel owner, you come and work with me, we'll build a stadium, you have some shares in the company, and you run the hotel. I don't have to run the hotel, you run the hotel, and you make sure it's profitable, 
and I'll run the football business and make sure that that's profitable. And then we split with 50 50, we split the profits. Yeah. So football is like a joint venture. You've got to have your hospitality team, you've got to have your football team, you've got to have your, your broadcasting um, team, advertising. You know, you have a team, an organization on that company. And that's why I say we need to get the clubs incorporated because if you have a company, you can then issue the shares, you can then have the, the construction of its articles slash constitution agreed upon, shareholders agreements, and that way people know where they stand. You see what I mean? Why not? We have partnerships which are not obviously incorporated under the government, companies are. They're not, um, they don't have statutory obligations like companies, which obviously... Mm -hmm. So I always, you know, I'm of the view that we... We elect our MPs into Parliament, they pass a piece of legislation, Companies Act 2015, and yet in football, we're not using it. It's the best corporate governance um, legislation there is. So the problem is, is our football teams are not using it. That's the problem. Um, and if we use it, and if we get um, the right people into those organisations, um, it will be successful. I, I, you know, yes, there'll be hurdles and challenges, like anything in life, but if we get the right structures in place, we can be successful. Well, our, our, I don't know how we're going to get away, Jack, from politicizing our football, because unfortunately, even the clubs, even the ownership of most of the clubs has been so politicized. That's why we don't even have the right personnel running these clubs. Mm. And that's the more reason why we have to sink into them that you people need to change your structures. You need to look at how your club is going to be sustainable over the years. So, and uh, be able to uh, get some investment in the club. Uh, I've been having discussion with uh, AFC and uh, Gormaya management, um, looking at the model whereby Inter Milan and AC Milan share the same thing for the league matches. They're the two big clubs. If they can uh, get people investing in the two big clubs, they can build that stadium as fast as possible. Because they have the numbers that people follow in the club. It's so the sweet, the top big clubs in the country. In and fact, it won't take a long time before uh, them realizing that uh, the club is more profitable than just uh, depending on that sponsorship plan. And I'll, I'll also add to what Jack said. We're talking about 16 clubs, yeah? Kenya is 47 counties with 55 million people estimated. We, if clubs, look, every club will have its interest into why it exists, yeah? What we as a league have to do is make sure there's a criteria, and that criteria is set to professionalism, yeah? Now, if a club says, well, we want to be political, that's fine. There's lots of political clubs in England. There's lots of political clubs in America. They have literally football, basketball, rugby, and American football teams. And literally for political campaigning, yeah? But they're not in the professional league. And we, as the professional league, if, if we're about professionalism, we have to set these as a criteria. And that means we can also look at other counties in which we can incorporate new clubs and work with people in those counties in the, the local government mm -hmm. and try and uh, neutralize what, what I would say is the polarization of Nairobi. Yeah, because every football club seems to exist here. Yeah, so if we can get more counties involved in professionalizing football here, I think we'll have more success. Um, and it's not to exclude the, the, the current stakeholders, it's to expand, make it more inclusive opinions. So for me, I want to make football more in inclusive, the professional game. And that's how it will succeed in the objectives that we're putting forward. And we'll invite the 16 clubs and the nationwide clubs to consider adopting some of these objectives. And it will make them more attractive for their investment. You know, an investment will make them sustainable. And then they don't have to go running around looking for sponsors. You know? that note, the, the first team, I think, from is it Kirinyaga? has finally come into the Premier League, Fortune Sacco, they got promoted the other day. So that's getting more teams from all, all over the country into the top flight, which I think will, will, will do well. Tell me about this academy you mentioned. You mentioned an academy in one of your four points. Is that going to be a physical academy? The football, academy business, or uh, the football business academy will be a physical. Um, we're looking at um, office space at the moment for it, um, and it will be in partnership with an established um, curriculum body. Um, so we're looking at establishing the Kenya Premier League um, Football Business Academy, which will be able to offer students and professionals a curriculum in which to get their knowledge and skills in the football business, um, and also give them a route to network with some of the best 
and most established sports organisations in the world. Because I think what essentially what we need to create here is the environment of football and also the opportunities that it can bring. So that for me is one of that's why I put it as the second object, the second most important thing that we can do, and also get the current stable of football administrators in Kenya get them into a position where they're confident and they're all singing from the same hymn and they can all understand, you know, the business that in which they're in. You know, this is, this is going to revolutionize football. Right, step by step process. This, uh, this, is what, this is what we should have done 10 years ago. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's happening been. now. Yeah, but it's, it's happening been. now, which I think is... I mean, that when you actually deeply understand what it is you guys are doing, it's basically professional night in football. Professional. I see teams like Comoros, I see teams like Malawi, I see teams going for AFCON when Kenya is not there, and Kenya can't even qualify. And it's frustrating. They have a population of one, two, three million Cape Verde, you know. And I'm like, the talent in this country, when are we going to get it right? And I think we're finally doing it. We just have due to being in a good environment for all the football lovers to feel free and be able to give up the most uh, in terms of uh, working together and making it sustainable. Yeah, and, I, and I, you know, if you look at football in England, you know, I know the history um, very well, but it didn't start off as a big branding profitable machine. Like sports marketing is what the last 10 years is a phenomenon. Mm -hmm. People are still like getting to grips with it because all the metadata has only really come to pass since all these social media platforms come into existence and obviously the smartphone. So I would say we as, as a country, we are ahead of maybe some of the most developed football nations in their journey because we have the advantage of perspective and the history in which they've gotten through to get to where they are and we've got the metadata. So I'm, I'm quite confident that we can establish things very quickly because the data is there to support, you know, Kenyan, Kenyans may not know this, but their social media and online mentions of football is a number that exceeds the country's population. <laughs> so, you know, anyone who's an investor or an advertiser or a sponsor will look at that and say, wow, we can reach a lot of people through sports because Kenyans are talking about it yeah. and searching it. So, and, and part of the reason we changed, um, we wanted to use Kenya instead of Kenyan is because when you go on Google um, analytics and you see how many people are searching the word Kenya, it's far higher. It's in the billions, and the people who are searching Kenyans is in the millions. So it's about a numbers game. And so for, for us, we're not only trying to create the best organization in, in Africa from a football league, but also the best brand. And the brand is a word Kenya. Kenya. And when you brand that word, it's online. You see what I mean? So whatever people search, they will find. So we, we, we've been methodical in, in what is actually making brands work and how we can implement the same kind of procedure and decision making around that. When can we see some fruits of this labour? <laughs> fruits what, what's, what's, what's your implementation plan? Your impl implementation schedules? That's so we're making announcements, you know, look, as I said, the organisation, we need to get more, it can't just be me and Jack running the Kenya program, we need to bring more directors onto the board from, you know, global organisations and domestic, we want to bring them together, we want to um, implement uh, a, a schedule in which to rebrand, so we've got our restructuring, rebranding, and then club investments, which will kind of be simultaneous with a rebranding process. So our job right now is to restructure the Kenya Premier League. We're looking at new offices, we're looking at bringing on board the right people, and then simultaneously we're looking at rebranding the league. So we want to make sure that the organisation is being represented by the best brand we can possibly put together. And that will be a process that we um, do with a, we'll make an announcement with an agency and that agency will be coming to Kenya to work with the stakeholders. And we want this brand to be, uh, you know, at the same quality and level as every other sports brand in the world, but authentic and relatable to Kenya. You know, we want Kenya's culture, we want Kenya's um, history 
to be a part of that brand. And I think that will speak to Kenyans, you know, in a way in which they probably never know. So, yeah, we want to create the best league in Africa. That has to be our mantle. How do we become the best league? And we're putting, you know, we're making the steps to make that happen. Yeah. <laughs> How are you financing your operations? We finance through our operations through private equity. <laughs> Why is he breathing? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> hey, I always ask the question. It's like everybody question. sees things are above board. We, we finance our operations through private equity. We have partners who obviously are in the sports industry who finance these types of things. So we're not operating as a, as a you know, we need sponsors we're, we're operating as a business mm. it's like how does the uh, how does um, any hotel in kenya finance its operation it has investors put capital in to cover the cost and expenditure income is just to i guess separate the profit from the loss mm -hmm. yeah so we have investment that finances our operation and that will finance the the various um, phases from one to three that we just discussed Realistically speaking, when can Harambe Stars go to the World Cup based on all this planning you're doing? Obviously, Kenya Premier League. Vision 2040? No, no, no. I mean, but, but Kenya Premier League is about, obviously, you the professional create... game. Harambe Stars is the FK. No, but you will create the players that the federation and the national team will then draw yeah. on. Well, if our, if our plan, obviously, is implemented and executed within the period that we want it to be, this country can produce a stable of players that gives us the, the opportunity to qualify. You see what I mean? No one can, no one person can say we can qualify because even if you have the best team, you may not even okay. score a goal. Let me rephrase. Um, right now, it means we are looking at, say, a 10, 8, 12-year-old. That will be the first professional players we're going to see come out of this plan. Yeah. Well, we're in 2022 right now. I think it, if you're talking about World Cups, you've got to look a little further ahead. I think it's, 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 a, it's a five ten, to ten year plan for implementation in terms of. That's a ten year old now. Yeah, in terms of results, mm. I think you've got to look up after 25. Yeah. Kenya's got yeah, a long way to go to be qualified. Yeah, this is the Cups. kind of discussion that we hopefully will have with, with the FA, seeing our national team. Uh, be one of the best teams in the, African, in the African continent. And I remember the days when Nyoma was in office, we, we shared within the 10 year plan for our national team. And that, that was going to happen in 2022 this year. But uh, uh, different administrations. You would have had to put that investment in 2012. Yeah. Exactly. And that was a plan that uh, we could see that it was going to work. We had a, a broadcast partner, we had title partners. Everybody was behind Yeah. So uh, we just have to. was employed. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to have the right football philosophy. And yeah. now, yeah. you know, you look at yeah. Germany. Yeah. 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 Germany's been a powerhouse in terms of winning and qualifying. But they they had a, a huge change when obviously um, I think it was Klinsmann left in 2007. And they implemented a football philosophy that all the coaches in that country and all the clubs adopted and implemented. And that's why you see Germany, the style of football in the, let's say, the last 10 years was completely different. To from the, before. From before. They had very skillful players, very adaptable players. So we have to look at what is the best football philosophy that we can implement here in Kenya. I mean, the Dutch and the Brazilians are, let's say, the masters of the game. How do we implement their, their philosophy here in Kenya? So all our coaches from primary schools to secondary schools to academies and private clubs are taking these five-year-olds all the way up and playing the same way. Same That's style. That's how we get to a That's successful right. national team. We don't team. have a style. <laughs> <laughs> we play. But thank you, guys. Thank you. I mean, thank you for this conversation. I mean, I saw the strategic plan on paper, but there's so many things you said that have actually now made sense that this is doable. This is doable. And we just need the just need the right people in the right place with the right attitude and to work. And they're there. I mean, we have some yeah. best executives in, in Africa, don't we, here in Kenya? So we're there. All right.
right. Well, thank you. Uh, CEO of uh, Kenya Premier League, Jaco Guda, and uh, Commercial Director, Taiwo Tino. Thanks for coming on Radio Live. We will make sure we get the message out and we keep talking and telling people, believe, believe, believe. And yeah, yeah. We laughed when I said there's a new sheriff in town, but <laughs> now people have to get the perception that these are people we can trust and work with. Generally speaking, we need to change the perception yeah. of Kenyan uh, football. Um, and we'll be we'll be making announcements in the coming weeks and months that mm. will, for me, show the action and the intent <clears throat> behind what we're doing. And yeah, trust and confidence are the cornerstones of business. And we do have to do and make the right moves to show people this is our ambition, this is our direction, so that they can feel like yeah, they fit within our value system. Thank you for coming on Radu Live and thank you guys for watching. Uh, by the way, leave your comments because I'd, hey, I can't wait for these comments <laughs> and I'll share them with you. Um, but we'll see you again next week on Radu Live. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.